So uh, I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of Tuesday, May 14, to order at 2.05 p.m. Thank you, everyone who's here for being here. Um, we do not have a quorum of the council, so we won't call it, um, we won't call a council meeting to order unless another member of the council comes. And uh, just for notes, uh, so everybody's aware, we do have somebody who's uh, taking notes. And uh, the agenda item about the local option community impact fee for um, short-term rentals um, we're going to take up after we take up the budget uh, because I want to um, not um, exhaust the staff by talking about something other than the budget so that they're here to talk to tell us about. And uh, therefore, um, we'll start with uh, the budget and um, uh, immediately go into discussion of general government and uh, start with the town manager. And I wanted to see if there were any um, overall questions. I have one regarding um, page 14 um, before getting into the very specific line item budgets. And um, it's a fairly uh, straightforward thing, but under licenses and permits, I wasn't sure what portions of licenses and permits end up in general government and why there's the precipitous drop in projected revenue for whatever that portion of uh, the budget is. Okay, so to repeat that, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. So on page 14, the point was that um, because of the change in government, uh, liquor licenses are now issued um, in a different way, and therefore that's what the licenses and permits section is there. Um, in the general government. It's not money that's lost to the town. It was just no longer under select board because the select board is no, no longer in existence as the licensing authority and it's mid move to inspections. So that um, explains that changed line item. So thank you very much. And are there any other general overall questions before we turn it um, over to um, Paul, who's going to talk to us about three sections, starting with town council on page 16, the town manager section on page 18, and then jumping to the legal section on page 27, um, of, so you know where to look for in your budget for the items that um, he was going to talk about. Paul? Well, actually, I'm going to ask uh, Sonia Aldrich, our interim finance director to speak first, if that's okay with you. Certainly. Okay, I'm gonna try to go th um, through a whole overview of all of the general government departments. And if you have any specific questions, I've got all the backup behind me to answer all your questions. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to start off the whole thing with accomplishments this year. And um, I wanted to say that this year has been a challenge and I feel our biggest accomplishment was getting here to the point where we are here presenting you our budget. And all the hard work everyone put into the change in governance the trans in the transition of this room. And how did we get here? The endless hours that you all put into this, the town manager and his staff support, and I really don't think Paul has a life outside of town hall. <laughs> the IT department for all the tech support and patience for all of us. The facilities department, including inspections and public works who made this room so awesome. The town clerk's office for their endless hours of work and dedication to keep everyone organized, including me. <clears throat> and most importantly, the finance department. 
David, Sherry, Jennifer, Holly, and all our staff in the finance department. Sorry, I keep forgetting. I can't turn away from this thing. We, we kept the town running by assessing, billing, collecting, investing, procuring goods and services, and paying our employees and the bills. We did all of this and created the budget you see in front of you. I'm extremely proud to be a part of this team. Moving forward, we will be without a key person behind the scenes that pulls most of the budget documents together for us. Her endless spreadsheets and charts, Maria Racca, who has been a part of this team for over 28 years. The last two, work, the last two working remotely from her home in Maine. Her last day is tomorrow, May 15th. We had hoped to get her here today so you could meet her in person. And I wanted to say thank you, Maria. I also want to recognize the person who worked with her for the last 10 months, sorry, <laughs> trying to learn to navigate through all the spreadsheets and multiple parts that make up the document you have in front of you. That has not been an easy task, not for Holly, who did this, or any of us sharing the same office space. Thank you, Paul. That's very true. <laughs> um, Sean Mangano from the school, it's always a pleasure working with him, and we very much appreciate all the work he did on the capital plan. Now I'll get into the budget. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll let you I pause for a that. second and just say that, um, uh, at least for me who worked with Maria over the years in the finance, old finance committee and otherwise uh, extend her best wishes on whatever goes forward from here in her life. Uh, Going to miss her knowing that she's there. Thank you. Um, so in the town, town council budget, which starts on page 16, and the finances are on page 17, the significant change there is that it's new. It, it, and the budget includes salaries of 67.5, which is per the charter, and operating expenses of 32.5. And this is just an estimate from the, from the um, half a year that we've been in place now. So. That's going to change as we get more trend. It could go up, it could go down, depending on what the needs show. Should I stop at every single one and give you a chance to ask questions or just keep going? Uh, are, if you're not coming back to town to the town council page, I guess I would stop to see if there are other questions. I, I have a question about the money for training. Um, I assume that the conference in Boston was took a good deal of that. I'm just kind of curious to know how much. I can't answer exactly how much the the uh, Boston trip was, but the expenses to date have been around fifteen thousand um, dollars. And the other meetings that we go to MMA, I, I, we don't have to pay for those, or do we? Or do we have a big dues to the association? So, so the. Um out of the town manager's budget, we pay the dues to the Mass Municipal Association. Included in those dues are membership in the Mass Municipal Counselors Association, which is your what, what, you're, what you go to a lot of times. So occasion, the MMCA tends not to have um, a fee for attending, but if there is a fee for something, that is something that would come out of these expenses. Well, I, I do say they are useful. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't had a chance to read most of those magazines, but I picked up one and started reading it, and I said, oh my God, and I discovered a bill that's coming through, which I'm very upset about. So uh, if there were more time, uh, we would probably learn even more there. So I, I guess I would say, maybe I wouldn't mind if you drew our attention to some of the articles in there that you thought were particularly timely. That would be useful. Sure. Um, the next budget would be the town manager's yeah. budget, and that starts yeah, wait a minute, on... Kathy. I just staying on town council, the rehabbing of this room to make it where we are, have you put those expenses under town council or have you put them under general? So those would be in the prior fiscal year, the current fiscal year, FY19. Right. So those are expenses that came out of capital money that we So have. they were out of the last year? Not under town council. So you're right. not expecting any future ones in terms of IT? Town council specific, so the computers we're using and other things we've we've been invested in us. Yes, <laughs> and and you'll be here for three years, so we don't expect another investment in time in computers. 
other than the <clears throat> a person to take down our minutes, we still have that expense to be That's right. we have not, added. Right. We have not put that in this budget at this point in time. Okay. Which expense, I'm sorry? For minutes, oh. someone to so, take down. Yeah. Our so t to, for the town council minutes, those are being done by the, yeah, by the clerk to the no, council. No, no, just the committee. But for all the other committees, yeah. we're still working on a solution for that. Okay. Which I know is a high priority for the council. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, town manager's budget starts on page 18. Finance part is on page 20. Um, the decrease in salaries here is due to the elimination of the select board and, and some staff turnover. We also moved $1,200 from extra help of the operating budget for travel expenses. That was a little short, so we moved that there. And then the, um, the next page, 21, is town meeting budget. This is here for historical data only. That will eventually go away. Any questions on the town manager's budget? Come on, you've got to have a lot of questions there. Uh, have you... I know that uh, staffing is always a question of both what we need and what we can afford. And you look at both of them very closely as you develop the budget plan for the year. Um, it's always been a concern, um, formerly of the select board, and now it becomes a problem of the town council as to whether you or ha have enough assistance within your office and whether that is a decision that you're making based <coughs> upon need or based upon resources and um, what we're losing if it's based on resources. So a big component of the job from the town manager's office, which is the licensing function, has moved to the second floor. So that's um, less work that is being done by our office. The more work that has been taken on is the um, community participation officers, mm -hmm. and there's two people in our office, one in IT, who are taking the, uh, the bulk of that work on. Um, and I think, you know, we're still sort of sorting out what the level of work is going to be, and, you know, we have pretty much daily conversations with the clerk's office about who's doing this or that. Um, trying to make sure that we can keep the website up to date and at the level that you, you have ex that you expect it to be. There's a lot of moving pieces to it and um, the new thing that we're sort of trying to manage is SharePoint, which you've all actually come to master pretty quickly um, in trying to make that communication from SharePoint to the website to our uh, archive folders is, is just a cumbersome task at this moment in time. We're looking at legislative solutions to address that, which would be a software solution, but we're not there yet. Um, so in terms of staffing, I think uh, we won't know for uh, until next budget year exactly how this is all gonna work out. If, the, if the, the appointing three people to be the CPOs was kind of a test to see if, we could, if that was a good model or not, if that met the needs of the council and the town, I think it seems to be working pretty well, but uh, but basically the budget that you see is sort of a uh, status quo budget of just moving forward with what we have now. Okay. I, I was going to ask uh, a similar question, just building on the draw on staff that have other jobs to do, um, both from your perspective and then I think at some point, um, what are the best ways to get it from the council's perspective? So the issue of minute taking or SharePoint is a software that is extremely useful, but it also has some quirks that we're all doing workarounds on them. So just over the next year, I think we need to figure out, you know, how well it's working and if it's not working well, you know, uh, what is an alternative? Agreed, and I think that you'll hear more in the, when we get into the finance. We're, we're pretty um, skeletal, have a skeleton staff right now, and I think you're gonna see that with the clerk's office, that they have taken on an enormous amount of work with the existing staff that they had previously, 
and uh, the work that they've taken on is more than what town meeting had them do. It's significantly more. And so the staffing in that office will have to be reviewed. Um, we're, we're still looking at the staffing. We are down two um, major uh, uh, piece, uh, people in the finance department. And so that's put a burden on a lot of our staff there. And they um, have stepped up clearly in doing the work, but we are advertising for one new position, at the, not new position, fill a position right now uh, in that office. But there's some long-term things, especially with Maria Rocca uh, moving on, that we'll be looking at how to fill that, that kind of function as well. There's, so we have the resources in, in, within the budget to do these things, but in actually do, getting that going forward will be something we'll want to talk about. Yes, sir. Um, now my favorite department, the finance department. Mm. Huh? This, um, and it starts on page 22. I always jump to the finance pages. It's just what I'm drawn to. So that's on page 26. Um, the significant changes in personnel services in the finance department are um, with, with the FTEs, if you notice, it's up 0.3. This is the net of many changes that happen in the finance department. First, a position, an in-house position for ambulance billing was eliminated because we out started outsourcing our ambulance billing. Then we added a 0.6 position for customer service at the counter downstairs, and we share this position. It's a full-time position, but we share it with leisure services registration. Then we added a 0.5 position for our payroll and benefits coordinator, and she's been here with us for 30-something years, but when we went from self-insured to being fully insured, we lost half the funding for her position because she was being paid out of the health claims trust fund. And even though we're not self-insured and we're fully insured, we still have all the same work that still needs to be done for that. And then we added a point two position for procurement officer. We had um, we were sharing the procurement officer with the school department, and they had some tough decisions to make for fiscal year 19. So they reduced that um, that financing for them, and we picked that up, which gives you the net of point three zero for FTEs. The increase in the operating budget is a result of what it, of the ambulance billing. We're now outsourcing, so it becomes an operating expense instead of a salary line. And that's pretty much it for the finance. Is there any questions within the departments there? I just need to understand um, better the, the outsourcing has moved from the personnel line item to the operating expense line item? It used to be, yes, an employee, so it used to be in salaries. We had to move that from salaries to the operating budget because we're now paying a company to do the outsourcing. Thank so it's you. just a shift. Which, which uh, makes it difficult to sort of comprehend is when you look at the percent changes, they look so, one looks so large and relation to the other, but that's because of the size of the budget line itself. Right. Yes. There's a note that when you, sorry, when you switched that um, ambulance billing, it actually increased? Did, did it increase the total cost for that service, or is it just, it, it, or, you know, or are we saving money by outsourcing it? Well, that's to be determined. Okay. We have enough trend to really, to, for me to really answer that at this point in time. We just started in March of last year. So um, that's to be continued. I believe we are saving, but. So um, along with the finance department goes the employee benefits, which start on page 34. And this budget is where we pay all of our benefits from, such as health insurance, life insurance, Medicare, and where we hold our salary reserves for unsettled contracts. 
Once the contracts are settled, we move it to the appropriate departments. The net increase is a result of salary reserve increase and our health insurance changes, which was only 0.06% this year. Another part um, that the finance department handles is, this is not part of general government, but I thought it was appropriate to put it in here with the finance department, and is that that's our debt service. If you look on page 115 of the budget book, this is where we pay our general fund debt service from. It's a list of all of our outstanding payments that we need to make, the principal and the interest, for all the projects that we currently borrow for. Um, the debt service is provided for in the capital plan. So when we do the 9.5% of the tax levy, we subtract what our debt service is going to be and what's left is what's available for new capital. But this is where it gets paid out of um, that line item. Other expenses, which is on page 117 and 118, this includes our OPEB, which we contribute to our OPEB, we started off with 100,000 and we increased 100,000 every year until we reached the 500 mark and we're staying steady at 500 and hope we can continue that as we go forward. This is also where we used to have our reserve fund transfer, which town meeting used to vote about $100,000 a year, which was in the custody of the um, previous finance committee. So if we had an emergency in the middle of the year and we needed to do some funding, they could transfer that to whatever appropriate department. We mostly use that to cover our um, snow and ice deficits if we had it. And then there's the assessment section on page 120. This includes any of the cherry sheet assessments, um, our retirement assessment for the general fund portion only, the enterprise funds pays their portion out of their um, accounts. And then there's the regional county lockup fee, which is run by the Hampshire County Sheriff, and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission assessment for regional planning services. Another part of the finance department is general services. And these budgets pay for our annual audit, our property and casualty insurance, our postage, our copier services and supplies, and central office supplies and small equipment. Oh, I'm sorry, page 47 starts. So let's stop for a moment and see if there are questions about the sections that we've just described. And one thing that you touched on was um, how snow and ice and other, which is the most frequent emergency, but not the only mm -hmm. that has ever happened. Uh, but uh, I guess the question is, what would be the, pl where are we for um, the current fiscal year that's ending in snow and ice? And what would be the mechanism for dealing with it under our new form of government? Well, I talked to the town manager about this this morning. We have a, a approximately $115,000 deficit in snow and ice. We have enough savings in general government to cover that, so we'll be coming to you for an FY19 budget amendment, which will move that money from general government to um, public works. And there may be some a, tran a small transfer into... Um, conservation and development, but I'm not sure yet. I'm still waiting to see how much savings we have there. Uh, am I correct that we don't make those adjustments till after the close of the fiscal year? Uh, it, it used to be done at the annual town meeting, and it should be done before, before June 30th. Okay, thank you. I think in the future, it depends on how we vote our budget. If we vote our budget as one number, then we wouldn't have to have an order to move money around. It could just be done with a notice to the council. Yes, uh, Mandy? If you want it done in June, we just need to be aware of the charter requirements for separate hearings on that different, I think there'd be a charter requirement for a finance committee hearing on that or a town council hearing for the separate I, appropriation or change. We should just check that and make sure we meet those deadlines. All right, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. 
Is there any reason why we couldn't just add it to the orders for this budget? I mean, normally it used to be on the warrant. It just said the previous year's budget amendment. So if we write the orders up and have it be part of this whole budget process, do you, and can it be a part of the hearings that we have already in place, or does it have to be totally separate? That I don't know. I'm reading the section in the charter that says when the town manager submits a request for a new appropriation of any sum, either as a supplement to some item in the annual budget or for an item or items not included in the annual budget is adopted, then it has to go through the whole finance committee process. And so the question would be, is it a new appropriation or a supplement, or is it just a transfer that doesn't have to go It's just a that? transfer. So maybe it doesn't need a separate hearing. Thank you. Are we keep going? Anything else? <laughs> um, the next is the HR budget, and it's on page 31. Evelyn is very new to us, and she wasn't here during the budget cycle, so she asked me to point out any of the changes to the count to the finance committee and she's here to answer any follow-up questions. Um, the increase in HR salaries in FTE is the HR manager that that was previously funded from the health claims trust fund as well and it's now part of the general fund so it shows up as a new FTE even though it's not a new position it was an existing position it's just the funding that changed. So when we calculate uh, whether we're saving by health insurance, are we, is that being factored into the calculation? Into the? Into the, into the assessment of how much money is uh, being saved from the prior year on health insurance costs. Not sure I'm understanding, but I know that because we had such a great savings in our um, health insurance premiums this year, increasing only 0 0.06, it made us made it possible for us to transition these positions into the general fund. I, I guess yeah. I assume that those were individually reflected in each budget under employee benefits, health care. Health care, yes. But you're talking about the position. I'm, I guess I'm confused about the, about the question. Yeah, no, it's just a question of how to think about a position that it is, is uh, administering the health insurance budget and what, what that, if that was an expense that was originally being borne, previously being borne by the um, self insurance plan and is now being borne by the town, then the total cost of our insurance is the premiums were our share of the premiums plus that position. Correct. I don't think there's too much else we can say on it at this point, just to understand it. So. Um, next is the facilities budget. Can I just ask, um, the, the, we're bearing, the town is now directly paying the full cost. The person has, is no longer doing the claims related costs, so there was other work that there was for that person to do. Right, they're still monitoring the claims, they're still doing all the billing, they're still enrolling people, they're still making all the changes. They're still doing everything they were doing, it's just, um, it just wasn't, co it's covered. We're no longer way. the insurance company now, which is basically what we were. We were paying premiums to our health insurance trust to pay all of this. Now we're paying Maya, but we're not paying them for some of the stuff that's okay. still being done in-house. <laughs> George is kind of new to this budget too, and he kind of got thrust into this, so I can, I can talk on the changes, and if there's any um, 
there, there is no changes in the facilities budget, actually. I was looking through it. There's no increases to the operating budget. But I also, I wanted to point out that um, we're expecting increased cost in utilities for fiscal year 20. We didn't make any adjustments in this year, but later on in the year, if we don't have enough savings from other areas, we may be asking for a supplemental appropriation. But this is very early in the game, and I can't say we'll be doing that for sure. I just want everybody to be aware. And um, George is our new facilities director. I'm not sure what the, cha what the changes were. I figured the town manager could elaborate on that a little more. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. So um, when our previous facilities director, uh, we know uh, moved on, um, we worked with the um, library to uh, secure George to work part-time at the library, part-time for the, for the town. So we have a shared position now, which gave enhanced responsibilities to George. And by combining two positions, we were saving some funds in the, in the meantime. Uh, so George's responsibility now is, includes continuing work at the library, plus overseeing the maintenance staff uh, for the town. He's been doing a really terrific job, and we really appreciate him taking on the new responsibilities. And we also appreciate uh, Sharon Sherry for being open to having the conversation with us. Uh, we were able to keep them whole by giving them some additional um, maintenance uh, support uh, in terms of just day-to-day -day cleaning. Uh, and we were able to utilize George's higher level of, um, of skills to oversee some of the major project, larger projects that we have uh, coming in through the town's facilities. And the town's facilities include Town Hall, Banks Community Center, Police Department, Munson Library, North Amherst School. I think that pretty much captures most of the buildings that we're responsible for. And I lied. There is some savings in the facilities budget from the staff turnover of a little over $15,000. So the increase in the utility costs that are projected is because of uh, just energy cost projections of what Utilities. we would need to pay? I shut it off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right to the point, yes. <laughs> yeah. I do have a related question that uh, is really, a, I don't know if uh, town manager uh, and its director have gotten into this question yet, but we're getting to the, we're, we've had this discussion about developing our new buildings as being zero energy and um, increasing opportunities to do things within existing buildings um, to take advantage of solar and um, other opportunities. And uh, I was curious whether there's any thought has been given as to how we are going to measure and report the um, effects of those kinds of changes, whether there's going to be any way that we can really determine whether uh, the zero energy bylaw, for example, has, um, after, if, after it's in operation, has achieved its goals. Well, we, we can certainly measure the kilowatt hours that we're using, and that translates into actual dollars that are being saved. So if we start to implement uh, energy savings um, into any building, we, we track all of that, all the energy usage by building. And I think that goes into the larger calculation that Stephanie Ciccarello has done previously in terms of our total carbon footprint and the amount of energy that we use as a, as a town. Um, Lynn, and then that will also be relevant as the uh, climate and, no, excuse me, energy and climate action committee starts establishing and rec are recommending to the council to establish goals for the council. So it's similar tracking, if not the same. Kathy, you Yeah, it just, um, it looks like you can also track to the extent, it's not that I know that we're doing that much, but if we, <laughs> insulated the buildings better or made them more weatherproof that we're using less 
oil, gas, you know, some of the other utilities that wouldn't just be kilowatt hours. You know, just, I see you're tracking each, so we'd be able to see dollar-wise that, or cubic feet-wise that we were, yeah. Yeah. Do you have something, Dave? I was just going to um, add that George and I will be working closely with Stephanie Ciccarello to do assessments of all of our existing buildings. We have some funding through the Green Communities grants, and we'll be applying for more of that funding to complete those assessments, because really, you need to be able to compare kind of apples and oranges. What, what are we currently doing? What has a building uh, drawn on energy in previous years? And then through um, improvements to energy efficiency, both through insulation, new heating systems, et cetera, we can then kind of compare where we are today to where we could be if we enhanced, for instance, insulation at the Munson Library or put solar on the police station. All of those things George and I will be working on looking with our building commissioner, with our staff, and in particular through um, Stephanie. Yeah. I think it'd be, um, it's important for the community as a enterprise to make sure that what we think we're saving is actually there. It is a savings, but I think it's also important for the council, who's going to have a great interest in raising these questions, we'd be prepared to answer questions that are likely to arise. It's, you know, Pam, uh, Dorothy? Um, given the, I think it was that I uh, read that this spring is the wettest spring since they began keeping weather records. Uh, has water and um, is, is, has this been causing any problem with town buildings? Uh, nothing of significance as of yet, but we are watching it. Uh, and I can say, like the Jones building, uh, parts of the basement typically are wetter than normal. Um, I, but I haven't seen anything significant as of yet. Okay. Anything else? Okay. We'll turn back to you. I think I'm done. Okay. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for being so patient, and it's been a pleasure working with you this year, and I look forward to another year. Yes, uh, thank you. I think it goes the other way. Thank you for your patience yes. with us. <laughs> Did you have anything, Kathy? No, I was just saying thank you also. I, uh, Sonia has been fabulous to work with. Thank you. And your, all your department head. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate all the finance staff who've come today, and um, you've and pre prior presentations done such a great explanation of the work that your department does. That, um, we appreciate what all of you are doing every day for the town and uh, the education that you provided for the council to help us understand the important functions that we need to understand fully and. Your, um, all of you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Margaret's up next for the town clerk. And yeah. So I just wanted to mention one last thing. David Burgess was here, has announced his retirement, but we will have David to kick around because <laughs> hopefully he'll be uh, holding on for a couple, you know, on a part time basis going forward. So uh, he's already been thinking about the classification hearings for uh, next fiscal year, and so he's still contributing on a daily basis, so. Thank you. Okay, uh, earlier uh, Paul mentioned um, the significant amount of work that has shifted to the town clerk's office. Um, you'll see the town clerk and elections and registration budgets on page 38 to 43 of the budget book. Overall, the town clerk's uh, department, 1161, has increased by 0.3% or $1,068 for next year. Elections and registration uh, shows a $5,075 dollar increase or an 8% increase, and that's due to elections that I will explain. 
Uh, Chair Steinberg, Finance Committee members, Madam President, Council members, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share the Town Clerk Department's FY19 accomplishments and challenges and anticipated FY20 challenges from a budget perspective. On February 6th, along with others, I briefly introduced the Council to the Town Clerk's Department responsibilities. It bears repeating that many of the responsibilities of all Massachusetts city and town clerks, regardless of the municipality's demographics, <clears throat> excuse me, focus on the population, whether in its entirety or as a voting population for voting purposes. I certainly don't need to inform you what you already know, that Amherst has a highly mobile population, that it is similar to just a handful of other Massachusetts municipalities and that serving this unique population requires sufficient staffing resources. The FY19 town clerk budget funded uh, three full-time positions, the clerk, the assistant clerk, and a management assistant. This has been unchanged since the funding for a part-time position was removed from the budget several years ago. The recommended FY20 budget, again, includes funding for three full-time positions. In the coming year, in addition to my department's mandated routine duties, including but not limited to this annual census, vital records registration and issuance, passports, dog and other licensing and permitting, et cetera, we will conduct two elections, one in November for all elected local officials other than the council, and the other a March 2020 presidential primary, which by all accounts is going to draw significant voter interest. It is entirely possible then that the law is going to allow for early voting for all state elections, if not state and local elections. Federal Census Day is April 1st, 2020. As with prior decennial census processes, and as required by the job description, the town clerk is going to be needed to assist in the coordination of the process locally, and will then represent the town in the redistricting process. Throughout FY20, the town will likely proceed in earnest with the ranked choice voting initiative directed by Charter Section 10.10 .10 in order to implement RCV in time for the 2020 state primary and the presidential election. As the chief elections official, the town clerk must be an active participant throughout the entire process. Charter Section 10.12 also directs that the council and manager investigate lowering the voting age for town elections which the legislature is also looking at, and permitting non-citizens to vote in town elections and to seek and hold town elective office. The nature of these initiatives will also require active participation by the town clerk as the chief elections official. I'm probably the smallest piece of the general government budget, but I'll probably be the department head that speaks the most. <laughs> and I have to say, first of all, that I appreciate the many, many conversations I've had with Paul about the shift in work duties to the clerk's office. FY19 has been an extremely intense and challenging year for the department, to say the least. From the double elections in September and November to the governmental transition at the beginning of December, my department's two employees and I have been thoroughly immersed in town clerk work and since December have added town council support duties. Since being appointed as clerk of the council, my daily work has shifted almost entirely to the town council. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Since August 1st, when I came back to town, I've earned uh, more than 100 hours of additional compensatory time with more than 60 of those hours to council support. Athena O'Keefe, full-time management assistant in the town clerk's office and the town's only passport acceptance agent, yes, that service is high in demand, uh, has earned over 30 hours of compensatory time and 28 hours of overtime since December 1 to help me with council duties. Additionally, part-time extra help needed to assist the department while Athena and I do council-related work has totaled 176.5 hours since December 1st. Make no mistake, I am honored to have been appointed the uh, first clerk of the first elected town council in the town of Amherst. Personally, my work in support of the council has been both challenging and rewarding. The governmental transition has been a new experience for everyone, and frankly, the amount of work the council president, councilors, the town manager, myself, and many others have dedicated to the council's success has been unprecedented. It has taken a monumental team effort led by the manager 
to coordinate all administrative duties in support of this transition. After nearly six months, however, it has, been, it has become clear that the level of staff support the Council will require on an ongoing basis cannot be sustained by one person, this person who has additional full-time duties. Since the Council's establishment, I've dedicated the vast majority of my regular work hours and all of my additional hours to accomplishing as much as I can to support the Council as its clerk. However, it has been at the expense of some other important responsibilities to my full-time town clerk position and my staff, regrettably. Many of my town clerk duties, including vital records, registrations, ethics, and OML compliance and others, have shifted to Sue Audette, the assistant town clerk. I've had to delegate some clerk of council duties I'm unable to accomplish in my regular and additional hours, including drafting the full council's minutes for council approval, updating records of orders and votes, and occasional meeting preparation and coverage to Athena during her regular clerk work hours when we have extra help in the office and during additional overtime hours when we don't. My staff and I, uh, regrettably, again, are straining to complete some town clerk duties in a timely manner, such as public records compliance, which, which we're on, sometimes by the skin of our teeth, but we're on it, mm -hmm. and managing voter registration files and others, um, other, other tasks or responsibilities cannot be completed currently, such as month-end records management processes and updating permanent records, including those relevant to prior town meetings and elections. I simply ask, um, and Paul has already noted this, that there is a recognition for uh, staffing needs moving forward. I simply ask that the council remain cognizant of its staff support needs uh, moving forward so that a long-term sustainable solution the council deserves and requires can be funded and implemented. Meanwhile, we'll endeavor to support the council to the best of our collective ability. Thank you. Um, don't, don't, don't leave quite yet, but... Uh, some of the questions that are to follow up will go to the guys sitting to your right and our, our left of you. Because um, uh, the, the budget proposal for, that you've given to us, uh, Mr. Bachman, uh does not propose any addition for this department. No, no. And um, the, we're talking about a a budget year that begins on July 1 and runs till June 30 uh, of next year. Uh, is, are, is there any capacity to address the issue that was just raised? And I think that all of us have probably thought about to some extent. It's not included in this budget. Um, we were stretching to stay within our budgeted amount for this year. So there weren't extra funds to be allocated. Um, it is something that I felt like we needed to figure out where the uh, status point was going to be for the, um, uh, for the council, because I feel like the first six months is going to be intense. We all understood that. It could be the first nine months. I would like to revisit this uh, in the fall after Labor Day to sort of sense what is, the, what is the expectation of the council? Are we going to have as many meetings going forward as we have scheduled uh, recently? I mean, you're meeting two and three times a week. Uh, and so until I understand what that is going to look like going forward, I wasn't going to propose a new, new position. And if I were to propose a new position, it's going to be at the expense of what other position, really, because we're a position-heavy organization. Um. Appreciate that, and I think that I'm going to turn to other members of the, of the committee in just a second. I see that there are other hands up. I'm not ignoring you. Um, the uh, question that you've raised, I think, is an important one. I don't know if you have any um, speculation. I think all of us are speculating to some extent as to what our second year is going to be like as a council and whether... Uh, We've been incurring our time and your time and Paul's time and uh, because we are in transition and learning or and whether it will change as we gain familiarity with what we're doing or not. I mean, we, we just 
I'm not sure that I have an answer, um, but that is a thought um, that I think is on all of our minds and sounds like you're thinking along similar lines and um, I've recognized how much of a strain it's been. So I was going through the budget, I was very curious whether uh, we were going to have to be thinking about additional positions for your office. But uh, as one member of the council, I want to just say how much I appreciate what you've done for us. And uh, it has just been tremendous in getting us to where we are. So I thank you. I'm going to recognize my uh, colleagues on the committee starting to my right and then go in a full circle so that everybody has a chance to speak before we go on to other topics. Let's start with Lynn. So during the budget process, was I was asked by the town manager uh, to look at a new line item, which is called town council. I specific, specifically raised the issue of the town clerk's office. And I'm still very concerned and feel that um, going to a year-round government has not only increased the burden on both the town manager and the town clerk's office, but has raised the expectations of the public mm -hmm. to a point that we then have to turn to you for those responding to that expectation. Expectations of videos of meetings we never used to video that didn't even exist, expectations of minutes of meetings, uh, expectations that you know, in some of the new rules that are being proposed that we post votes, which I know we did with town meeting, but it was only the vote, it wasn't the minutes. Um, so those kinds of expectations are not just because we're starting up, but they're because we have a public that is watching. And at the same time, we have the pressure of people saying, oh, look at this town council, look how much it's costing us. Well, you know what, I hate to tell you, I figured out how much I earn an hour, and you don't want to know, mm -hmm. and you're coming close to that. So as much as I hear what the town manager is saying and will wait till September, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that, that we really do need to revisit this. We don't know what a second half of our year will look like. We don't know, we don't expect another year like six months like this, because we're Making, up, making it up as we fly the plane, as one of our counselors regularly says. But I do at the same time want to voice another serious concern, and that is the decennial census is no small deal. 140 some federal funds depend on our census count. And to enter a decennial census year without some assistance to the town clerk's office, I think is jeopardizing our own take on federal dollars. So I only, I want this to be looked at from at least those two perspectives as we go forward. Thank you. And, and let me just say, if I hadn't had you to call on, I wouldn't have known what to do. Thank you. Kathy, I said it goes uh, So I'm building on everything Lynn said. Um, I think it's great you're tracking the, the OT and compens compensatory time, and that you should be doing it for you and Athena, because we may already be paying for one whole person mm -hmm. extra. It's just, it's out of your two, you know, working around the clock. So, I mean, trying to think of quantifying that, and I, I understand that adding a person brings on, uh, since I used to work in the private sector, like there's a fringe benefit side to you know, working people extensive overtime <laughs> saves costs rather than another. But I think we need to be looking at we're incurring some of that anyway. And any shirking of tasks you really need to do that aren't just council, we, sh we shouldn't be treading over that line. I have a, a question and a point. Um, Right now, um, I think goodwill reigns. I think the public, at least those who communicate with me, are pleased with the council. So I think this is the time to add a staff person. Uh, the workload 
is not sustainable. We are extending time and effort beyond anything we thought we would have to do. We're doing it. We expect it to get a little bit better, but it's not going to go away. And there's the understanding that if we just get through this intense first part, then we'll be able to do some kind of a manageable thing. So it's both burnout on the town of the in terms of the town staff burning out, and it's burnout on counselors. If we want to encourage people to participate and run for office, and I, I don't think we're all going to run again in three years, um, then the job has to seem like something that a, a regular human being can do while perhaps having a job and a family. So we need more help. We need help with minutes, and I think we need it now. Um, and I think what Lynn said about the census and, and the elections and the craziness that's normally part of the town clerk office, is it's very big. Now, that's my statement. My question is, comp time is dealt with differently in different places. In some places, if you're called management, you don't get money. You're told, oh, you just get a bigger vacation sometime in the future. How is it dealt with here? That applies here to management positions, yes. So that means that you work very, very hard, you don't get paid anything extra, and you don't have time to take the time. Right? I've managed to find a few, a few slots of time to do what, do what I, I enjoy in life, and, which is beyond work. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> beyond work. <laughs> so um, so that, that, that does apply, and um, uh, comp time would be credited to any kind of leave. That I take. So, um, I want to. I want to clarify. I, I appreciate all your comments, and I want to clarify um, my comments or my my statement. Paul and I have had many conversations. I know from my prior, you know, from my prior career. I, I do understand the budget process, and I do understand where where some of his concerns lie. My intent was not to say. I want an additional person now. My intent is to say, think about the future. Think about what the council needs in the future. And then uh, plan accordingly. I know Paul is thinking about this, and, and uh, I, I support that. I just wanted to make sure that that was, that was clear to the council. Shall we? So <clears throat> comment and question. Comment is uh, just a it's very heartwarming and inspiring to see all of you all working so well together. And I feel really proud to be part of this town council where we have a team of people who are so supportive and, you know, it was really amazing. So congratulations. Uh, and my question was about rank choice voting. I don't know if you mentioned that already about the machinery. Do we the ta do that, we need that? That's going to be beginning in earnest with um, mm -hmm. with interviews being held in the very very near future for mm -hmm. rank choice voting commission, and the clerk is going to have to play a critical role in that entire in the rank choice voting rollout. So um, that's going to be another process in addition to the federal census yeah. process and everything else that's, mm -hmm. that's coming in the coming, that's going to be happening in the current coming year. So I was glad that uh, you brought that up because that was actually going to be my next question, which is really going to get into voting. So I'm going to come to it and then get, um, since we're now there, that is about the voting machines. Um, mm -hmm. Our voting machines are getting kind of up there in age anyway. They're old. And um, so, you know, there's a question of uh, what is the remaining life of the current voting machines um, and uh, how to rank choice voting. And then I think the other piece is uh, um, from the JCPC side. I think we put it, it's in the long range capital plan. It probably needs to be in the long range capital plan. So it's not it's not planned for FY twenty, it's planned for FY twenty one, I believe. So <coughs> any kind of machine purchase would be not in the coming year, I don't believe. It would be in the following year where the machines would first be implemented in the fall of twenty twenty. Um to the current voting machines, they are, I don't want to say they're on life support. They do require an awful lot of maintenance after some of them are, I believe, 
Well, some of them we had when I was here last. So I left in 2003, and so they are. Um, I was here when we changed voting equipment, when the town switched over from the big lever machines to the AccuVotes. Um, so they are getting up there in age. And not only that, it's highly unlikely that the machines that we have now are going to be able to accommodate ranked choice voting. That said, this, there are a couple of systems that the state has approved, voting systems the state has approved, that would be able to handle ranked choice voting. Um, so that's something that the commission is going to have to look at. Yeah, Lynn. Do you believe that it's honestly feasible to implement it by the spring election? It wouldn't be the spring election, it would be the fall elections of 2020. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. at, at the earliest. At the earliest. Yeah. At the earliest. And, and the um, voting machines are on the FY21 uh, capital plan. Mm -hmm. So we could purchase those in July yeah. 1. Yeah. I think the, uh, because there's another question regarding elections, and that is that uh, we know that there's been a lot of anxiety amongst the elementary schools about continuing on as voting sites and uh, whether there are any time factors that you need to work into your workload or capital costs that need to be put into the capital cost side as um, that question is being addressed. Paul and I have talked about this numerous times as well. Um, polling locations, potentially centralizing some polling locations to align with the five with the five districts, um, and, and many other options. We do understand there is a concern um, with the elementary schools. We also have a number of polling places that just simply are not are not adequate. Um, one of our precincts operates in the bay of a fire station. Um, we have another that has a lot of accessibility issues and others with parking issues. And it's something that's on our radar and we'll continue to discuss. Yeah. I'm just looking at my committee to see. Paul? Just, to, you know, one of the things um, we have talked about is some communities have just one location for the entire town. So you go to one location, all, you, have, you still have the precincts as required, but it's in one centralized location where there's adequate parking, there's adequate staffing, everything is in one location. So that's one of the solutions that is, is an option for the town. Whether that would be acceptable to the council or not is another question. I'm trying to imagine where that would be. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to imagine where that could possibly be. Um, so the, I, I, I want to make sure that as we thank you for everything, we also thank Paul and Sonia, who I think, of, and, and Sean sitting here over here, dealing with all of our technology problems. Uh, this has been a challenging year. Uh, transitions in government are not easy. And uh, the uh, requirements of the charter uh, added things to the um, needs of government and yet the budget has not increased to accommodate those. And I think that those, that is part of what we're seeing is trying to squeeze it out from an existing budget uh, that includes things like the uh, community participation officers, all the additional work to you, the additional work to Paul. So um, the change in the financial cycle. Uh, and I think that as we look at the budget, we have to look at that because the people of the town voted for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So if we're switching to IT, I just remind everybody that that's go backwards in your book to page 35 if you want to get to the right place. And okay. Sean. I can, be, I can keep mine a lot quicker. Um, so the significant changes, <coughs> excuse me, are, are mostly around personnel. We had um, our network system administrator who was half um, police department and half IT is now entirely IT. So that's why you see the increase. 
of half a position in IT. Uh, we also had a shift in our communi communications manager, Brianna, who's still funded entirely out of IT, but she is half, essentially half community participation officer, half IT. She's doing the, uh, a lot of the web work and she's moved up to the mezzanine. Um, so you see an increase of half. We essentially, IT has the same number of bodies. The other exception, it, or the other change is that um, Maria Rocca, who um, is moving on as of tomorrow, was also historically half IT, so she would provide some support for us in Munis and everything else. Um, the other change in our budget is um, our um, operating increased about $18,000 or $18,000 as a result of licensing um, renewals. So all, pretty much all the software that the town pays for, for any department outside of the school is um, is captured in that line item, so that's why that that increases across the different software packages, and that's why you see the increase there. That's, uh, that's what I got. Yeah, Paul. So um, I do want do want to mention that you know as the world changed a few you know, started a few you know, many years ago about moving from purchasing software to software as a service. So our operations have switched as well to, to purchasing software and a service as a service. Um, those, a lot of those things were in individual budgets and you know, independent, independent individual departments were making pretty big decisions based on their operating budget because software as a service is an easy thing to start to take on versus a major capital thing, um, capital investment in a, in a whole new software package. So Sean has done a really good job of sort of capturing all that. We wanted to make sure all that was captured in the IT service so there wasn't overlap and that there was a coherent decision-making process when we were purchasing a software as a service because once you purchase something as a service, you're pretty much stuck with it. Even though it's a little bit every month, it's there for a long time because you're not going to switch up your operations again. So he's worked really hard with all the other department heads to bring that to try to centralize some of that, that stuff. Um, the only thing I wanted to clarify is that the only change in salaries is moving the funding source from the police department from public safety to general government. It's been a position that's there. So if you look at the public safety budget, you'll see a 0.5 reduction. That's the IT person moving to the IT budget. We just thought it made sense to put it where it belonged. Um, Lynn. I the applications manager, which is in a dotted box? Yeah. Could you talk up, about that? Yeah, that position shows up in a dotted box with 0.33. That position exists entirely within IT, but it's funded um, by water and sewer. Historically, okay. that was a GIS administrator, which um, is, um, does a lot of support for water and sewer departments. So uh, water pays for a third, sewer a third, and general government a third. So they do work on other applications and the identification of appropriate ap applications. Yeah, so that that's uh, Mike Warner, and so he exists mm -hmm. entirely in IT, but um, is, fun is funded mm -hmm. by water and sewer. Thank you. Um, do we have, I know you have as an FY20 objective to install fiber optic network to replace um, Comcast fiber INET, um, and that's really into the capital side of the budget for, uh, for a large part, but um, the staff support, do we have the staff support that's needed for that? For the installation of the fiber, that's something that a contractor is going to do the majority of that. Um, there will be some management of that by IT. Um, I wouldn't say it's any more significant than some of the other projects that we take on in terms of, in terms of staff time. I know that some people have uh, raised the question of uh, whether there is any town provided broadband capacity that could be added in there and 
Is that something that has been considered and? It's something that can be considered. It changes entirely the process of getting on the polls. Um, if we were to go on the polls as a service provider, if we were to do that right now, we would have to negotiate with um, Eversource and Verizon to attach to the polls and where we are on the polls, um, which could potentially delay that with um, with us putting the fiber up there for um, for town use, we can use the existing municipal space that select board and now anytime there's a um, new poll that's put in, um, actually that would be town manager now, I believe. The agreement is that there's a certain amount of municipal space that we can be on, the, on that poll. So we can go up, um, essentially we can go up there without negotiating with Comcast and Verizon right now, or, um, Verizon and Eversource right now, if we were to put it up there for to be a service provider, it would change that attachment and, and potentially delay us getting on there. Uh, that being said, in the future, if we decided to to look into doing that, we we certainly can. Paul, oh. so the decision we made was to move forward with replacing the the INET as it is now because we can just do it as of right. Down the road, if the town chooses to go into a municipal broadband, that gives us the opportunity to that. It doesn't preclude us from doing that, but we didn't think that was something that we wanted to take on now, and we thought the permitting process would, was going to be delayed. And by the time we got there, um, we have a deadline with Comcast to replace that on ART, and they've given us money to do that. So we have to abide by that. And I guess my other question, and I'll just, I see your hand, Dorothy. Um, is the uh, downtown uh, public Wi-Fi, uh, is that moving along and are, are we, do we have the capacity within our current operation to, do, to correct those issues? Yeah, we're, um, we're planning within the month of May getting the, um, the bang center garage, the upper level of the bang center garage as a pilot, get two units up there, and then the plan is to do um, the rest in June, the rest of downtown, swap those out in June. Dorothy. Um, this is about um, high-speed internet. I think there's more than one way. I mean, and I, what, I, what I say may be totally wrong, but I was just in Sunnyside, Queens, and there's a major project going on by a private company that is digging in the streets, boxing off all the trees, and you can't park in any of the streets. And it's going. And I, I asked my friend who lives there, what's happening? She said, it's a con company. It's not the city. The city is not paying for it. A company is, has gotten permission, probably paid money to the city, to dig up on the roads and the sidewalks to install it, but it would be in, up to individuals if they wanted to connect. She was not planning to connect. She was sticking with Comcast. Um, but your situation here is that the town puts it in if it's going to happen, or how's that go? So, so as of right now, um, if somebody wanted to come and compete with Comcast, they could. If Verizon wanted to, um, if Verizon wanted to offer five BIOS to residents, they could. BIOS, uh, that's the name. Yeah. I think Verizon makes it makes a decision based on population and is essentially can they get enough subscribers here to to make money off of it all it all comes down to whether whether there's money in it for them or not in the same way that Amherst has one um, cable provider Comcast there's nothing that prevents another uh, cable pro provider coming in and negotiating to be up on the polls as well. Um, but there's such a cost to that that essentially Amherst isn't big enough for Charter to come here and compete and, and with Comcast. So, um, so there's nothing preventing a, another vendor from coming in from doing that. Um, and if um, it's one of those things that after we get past getting our fiber installed and everything, then it probably would make sense at that point to start looking into does it make sense for the town to offer some service or try and leverage something we have to offer service over that. 
I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I, I don't really need you to give me a long answer on okay. this one, but um, observing in places, in some places in Vermont where multiple towns have banded, banded together on the more community, what you said, become a service provider, um, would we at some point, once we've done our INET negotiations for the town, is there, is it a difficult, a lot of time to explore the potential benefits of, of regional or other towns, you know, because some don't have any services, so they, their only route is to bring something in. So it's sort of a scale issue. Do we get to a point where we could do it for less money for all the town people if we did it as a larger group? Yeah, that's, that's certainly a possibility. You'll see um, when Leverett did it, they had Hoyoke Gas and Electric come in and provide part of it, and they have Crocker as a private internet service provider essentially providing, Hoyoke Gas and Electric provides the pipe, Cro Crocker provides a service, does the billing, um, Crocker is who you call for support if your iPad can't connect to your Wi-Fi, those kind of things. So that, that something like that is certainly an option. Um, there's there's a lot of things that could be looked at at that point. Okay. Anything else on IT that anyone wants to ask? We really appreciate all that you've been doing for the uh, council um, to get us up and going and to answer our questions and provide us the support that has enabled us to really dig into the work and not have to think about pieces, so thank you for all that you've done for yeah. us. Thank you. Thanks for support and uh, patience with me and my staff. Thank you. So, um, are we ready uh, for Dave to take over? So to remind people, um, when you're looking at your budget book, get to page 84 for conservation, 87 for planning, and 90 for inspections. So oh, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. Joined by Rob Mora and Christine Brestrup. Uh, happy to come talk with you about conservation and development. Uh, we like to talk uh, about this area as a functional area. We believe it works very well together. Uh, the, we brought together uh, a team of, of professional staff that uh, work very well together, serve the community, uh, our, our developers, our citizens, our residents, um, and uh, today we're just going to talk a little bit about what we do and, and answer your questions. I think I'll ask Christine to begin and then uh, Rob and then we'll end with um, uh, conservation. Um, I think just looking ahead to the next fis fiscal year, um, overall, you know, we're, we're excited to be working with the town manager, with the council, with the CRC, the ECAC, on the shared goals that we are all embracing for the community. So that's, that's our job, and uh, we're excited to be working with all of you and the town manager and the rest of the council on those, those, those shared goals. So I'll turn it over to Christine. Hello, I'm Christine Brestrup, planning director, and I'm happy to be here with you today. I wanted to just tell you a little bit about um, our department, sort of reiterating some of the high points that we talked about last time. Um, we have a staff of five people in the planning department, um, planning director, two senior planners, one associate planner, and an adm administrative assistant. We share a permit administrator with the inspection services department. We're governed by state laws and regulations, and we're also governed by town bylaws, regulations, and standards. We provide support for or act as staff liaison to many of the boards and committees in town. And I won't list them all, but including uh, some of the highlights would be the Planning Board, the Zoning Board of Appeals, Design Review Board, the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, Historical Commission, Local Historic District Commission, and on and on. 
Um, one of our primary activities is to provide support for boards and committees that are land use permitting uh, boards. Um, these are primarily the Planning Board, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Historical Commission. Um, another thing that we work on is projects, and we have a long list of projects. Um, we shared some of them with you last time, but just to remind you, Groff Park is one of them. They're working on Groff Park improvements right now. We worked on the design and um, uh, planning for that project. The Dog Park, which is a project that's coming up and we'll get some highlights in probably sometime in mid-June. Um, downtown and Village Center planning. We're working on sign projects with wayfinding signs as well as writer's walk signs and soon to be recreational area signs. We have a big flood mapping project that's coming to um, an end, I hope, soon. Historical projects funded by CPAC uh, and we've also worked on a bicycle pedestrian network plan with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. We've helped the uh, Amherst Municipal Housing Trust with their project on the East Street School, trying to get affordable housing there. Um, we're hoping to start an ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan soon. We have a plan already, but we need to update it. And we also work on grant writing and administration of those grants, among many other things. Um, we're also committed to reaching out to the community to educate community members about what we do to explain zoning bylaws and other regulations, to inform people about town projects, and provide information about private projects that are going through the permitting process. We welcome community members to call us or come in to meet with us to ask questions about projects and applications. We try to put information online as much as we can. We hold frequent community forums to get input from the community on projects that we're working on, such as improvements to Groff Park, and the latest one that we are working on, which is um, the possibility of establishing a 40-yard district somewhere in town. In addition, we have a wealth of information about things that are going on in town, both online and in our department. So some of the next steps that we'd like to take in the near future would be to work with you all and the planning board to review the master plan, which we started to do last week and then decide um, about whether we wanted to update it at this point. Um, another thing is to rewrite parts or all of our zoning bylaw, and I know that's something that you're all interested in. We also want to engage the community in our ongoing projects, such as work on the community field, which is over by the high school, planning for our village centers, building projects that we've already planned, such as we hope eventually to build the North Common improvements, applying for more grants and finding support for future projects, and collaborating with other town departments, particularly uh, the DPW, on um, project re review and implementation so things can run smoothly. So some of the highlights of our FY20 budget are that our staff has essentially stayed the same in terms of the number of people over the past year. However, we've had some changes. We recently lost an administrative assistant to the building commissioner, who hired him to become the new license coordinator to work with the Licensing Commission. Um, but we've gained an administrative assistant who has a wide uh, range of experience with the health department and also inspection services. Her salary as a result of her longevity and experience is higher than the previous administrative assistant. So that's added about ten or $12,000 to our budget. We're very happy to have our new staff member, and she's very well organized, and she's an asset to the planning department. You'll probably see her on television because she comes to the planning board meetings. Our challenges in the coming year include helping town council to create our new form of government, including establishing processes for updating the master plan and amending the zoning bylaw, responding to the increasing complexity of private development applications. Many of them are unusual in their scope and unusual in their presentation. And also in uh, responding to the public permit review process. We also need to redistribute our workload among our staff members to be able to accommodate the needs of our new type of government. So we look forward to working with you as we plan for the future of Amherst, and I hope that you will um, come to, to ask us questions when you need to and, and find out information from us. Thank you. 
So we'll s stick with playing Kathy. Um, I'm going to try to quickly organize my thoughts, starting with um, I live in North Amherst, and I'm a District 1 counselor. So I'm looking at the future plans and thinking in several projects that I know have been in the works and that are collaborative. So uh, replanning the way the roads flow uh, and thinking about the intersection. So I've never quite understood the extent to which planning conservation and DPW work together on uh, thinking about what all of that would look like in terms of flows of people, flows of cars, future development. So anticipating what's going to be happening, uh, not just responding to what's going on now. Um, and so I, I don't completely know that. And then the other piece is where community input would be useful, um, as opposed to you've already got some um, helpful. So for example, when we went to an MMA recent meeting on economic development, uh, the state said, um, if you're going for a mass works grant, if you can get some testimonials attached of uh, entities that might not otherwise venture in because of traffic concerns and flow concerns, it's helpful. You know, so the before it happens, and we're facing an after it happens issue, but it looks like there's a lot of interest. So it's just that understanding that collaborative uh, process and thinking forward. So I think we uh, work pretty well with the DPW. I attend most of the Transportation Advisory Committee meetings, so I keep up on what they're doing. Um, they have a recent report that's been um, prepared by CDM Smith about the traffic issues in North Amherst, particularly with regard to that intersection of Montague Road and Sunderland Road, as well as the intersection of Pine Street Meadow and North Pleasant. Um, I think that the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee, will be looking at that next week at their uh, Wednesday meeting. Um, they're going to be taking an initial look at that and then thinking about where they want to go with it. We did have a series of planning um, forums back a number of years ago that some of you participated in, and we um, zeroed in on one configuration for the uh, intersection up there, but we think it's going to take a further look, and we want to reintroduce people to that project and, and bring people together to get your input. Um, so we are working collaboratively with DPW, and we will be working with conservation as well because we'll be crossing, um, there are two, two river crossings up there. So if there's any um, disturbance of wetlands or river bank or anything like that, the conservation department will have to uh, be informed and involved. Um, we are also hoping to uh, have $40,000 to hire a consultant to start um, thinking about a little bit more in depth about the planning process for that area, um, exactly where would various uses go, what, what would sidewalks look like, what we, might we do for streetscapes, and that would all involve um, public participation, um, you know, to really zero in on what is it going to look like and what are people going to be able to do there. Um, that's not something that's going to be solved by the DPW alone, that's going to be solved by planning, DPW and conservation and the public all coming together. Um, what was that, that? That's very useful, and I'm just, the um, issue that came up this weekend, just as an example, is the development opens up, and the bridge finally opens up to be able to exit. Uh, there's a concern that because the intersection is still as crowded as it is, summer and the other streets will become the speedway to avoid the intersection. And it's a small street, very residential, with a lot of kids on it, so I, that's what I'm thinking, like thinking of this is potentially going to happen, so how do we, either as it starts to happen, what do we do about it, um, you know, so that we don't uh, create a problem and not have a potential way of working on it until we get uh, alarms raised. You know, and I know you're already looking at the intersection at 116 as the new marijuana facility opens up and you can't walk across the road. There's not a pedestrian crossing, so someone alerted people about a wheelchair trying to get across, um, which is not, you, you, you know, so it's, it's that whole area which was 
built for horses and buggies, <laughs> um, not crowds. So trying to think what, what all of that feels like. So I think we are um, going to be focusing on, and that, on that in the next year or two. Um, and it's a very important area that's receiving a lot of attention. Um, various landowners up there have um, future plans for development of their properties. And so things will be changing up there, and we recognize that. And there are a lot of things coming together at this one time. And so it is certainly on our radar screen, and there are conversations going on about that. Paul? Just on that intersection, the Meadow Street, North Meadow Street um, 116 intersection, that is a state intersection. It's not a town intersection. And, I realize that. And so, so, so it is something that they are monitoring. Um, yeah, so it's, it's all part of this picture. And I didn't mean to don't just in an RE area, but I think this anticipating when, when, when the housing stock or development changes, everything else changes too, and we tend to change the other things after the fact just because of the, they're not a, always, can't be planned at the same time, you yeah. know. One thing that uh, I was thinking about as I was reading the bu budget in preparation for today's meeting, and then you've touched on it too, is that uh, you mentioned in the budget the housing production plan and the need to, um, update the housing production plan you've meant and there's also mention of the master plan in a much more complete and well appreciated presentation to the um, community resources committee which you talked about the amount of um, expense that's involved in that process as well as your own staff time and uh, have they been factored into future budget planning and uh, I think the other question is, is a more general piece as to when and how do you make the decision to um, seek a consultant to assist you as opposed to taking something on in-house? So consultants really are very helpful in, in bigger projects that require a lot of public input. One of the things they offer is they have experience in a lot of different cities and towns that they can bring to bear on our particular town and its issues. Um, they also are neutral, um, I won't say bystanders, they're neutral participants. They don't have an, anything to gain positive or negative from the outcome of a project. And so they tend to be more, uh, people tend to look at them with more, um, trust, I guess I would say, that what they're doing is completely neutral. They don't have an ax to grind one way or another. And um, so it's really, you know, their experience and their neutrality that I would say is uh, particularly useful, especially in a planning project where there are going to be people who disagree about um, the potential outcome. Anything else on planning? Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Hi, uh, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. Uh, talk a little bit about inspection services. Uh, we have our, our core uh, programs having to do with uh, building, uh, plumbing, electrical permit uh, issuance, and oversight of inspections. We also have the uh, management of the environmental health programs. Uh, so that can be anything from restaurant-related license and permitting to uh, livestock or tobacco or um, many other uh, licenses uh, across the town. Uh, code enforcement, uh, so that is uh, where we are uh, managing and overseeing the residential rental property uh, permitting and registration program. Uh, zoning enforcement and general application of the, the zoning bylaw. And then new to us this year is uh, licensing. So uh, all those licenses that were previously issued by the select board town manager's office have moved into inspection services and as uh, Chris mentioned earlier we created a position this year called the licensing coordinator uh, who is handling the processing of all those applications and uh, along with myself working closely with the board of license commissioners to create uh, rules regulations policies guidelines and update uh, all the license uh, permit and applications 
Uh, one other thing we do, we are responsible for inspection services, but don't actually perform the work. It's uh, overseeing the weights and measures program. So we do engage and hire the city of Northampton's inspector to do that work. Uh, we collect fees and monitor the status of those inspections here, uh, but everything else is done in the field by the uh, Northampton inspector. Uh, the, uh, some of the recent projects that our inspectors uh, have, have completed this past fall uh, included the Amherst, Science, Amherst College Science Center, uh, which was a very large uh, project. Um, the uh, completion of one East Pleasant Street uh, was last fall as well. Uh, some of the current projects that we're working on include North Square, uh, uh, that's 130 units with uh, about 20,000 square feet of commercial space. And then uh, University Drive is one of the other larger projects. That's another mixed use, 36 units uh, for affordable uh, under construction right now. Uh, looking this year, a couple projects uh, coming up that we expect to start uh, is the uh, mixed use building on Spring Street. Uh, and also uh, Aspen Heights was previously in front of the zoning board for an amendment to their proposal and have indicated that uh, as long as their settlement follows through as expected, they uh, intend to begin construction this year as well. So we're looking at those two possible starts. Uh, some of the uh, challenges as I spoke about uh, this year is uh, really working on that licensing. Uh, it's gonna be our focus how to incorporate that into our department and uh, provide a good complete service to the, to the applicant uh, who is also visiting our department for probably many other things. Uh, so just trying to create that coordination between the various inspectors across the department and administrative staff, uh, as well as uh, providing the support that the Board of License Commissioners needs to uh, create their, uh, their, all their documents. Um, we are hoping for a uh, permitting program to be uh, uh, purchased this year. Uh, we, we've been told this is something that was one of IT's projects and they are in, uh, sounds like maybe the final stages of selecting a vendor. So we're really excited about that. Uh, our program right now does not provide the efficiency we need to issue all the, the licenses and permits we have. Uh, it's pretty limited on some of the field use applications and so we're really looking forward to um, seeing that uh, come together this year. Uh, as far as our, our budget itself goes, um, really the only thing worth noting is the, the increase in the, um, the full-time uh, health uh, staff uh, uh, line item. And that, that was a result of a, uh, most of that was a result of a vacancy of uh, one of our entry-level administrative positions that was taken by a uh, staff person from another department who had longevity uh, in the town, uh, which uh, accounts for a, a significant amount of that increase. Uh, so, happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah, I, uh, I know there's actually a question over here. Uh, I was uh, interested in the uh, comment about the uh, needing to update our software. I thought Munis did everything in the world, but I guess the answer is Munis does a lot of things in the world, but not everything. So, uh, but I did see that on both uh, the IT side and your side. Um, question that I had is that on page um, 90, where the status update of FY19 objectives is listed. One was to establish a policy relating to bed and breakfast licensing pending state code changes. And uh, is it strictly bed and breakfast or does that apply to other types of short-term rentals other than traditional hotel and motel businesses? That, that is strictly bed and breakfast and um, the, what I was referring to there was mainly our sanitary codes, our health codes that uh, define when or when a, when a license uh, by the health department is needed. That is, something, that is something that has been unclear up until a recent change in the, uh, the state regulation, the state sanitary regulations, um, as far as defining the number of rooms or the number of guests that would stay and when, where the trigger is. And there's always, um, it was always difficult to respond to the 
um, the larger bed and breakfasts that are in the community when there, were, there was this unclear threshold of when the smaller uh, establishments should have licenses. So we feel like we were able to um, uh, clarify that now with the change that occurred and um, be, um, provide uh, clear, um, I guess, advice to applicants and how to um, deal with licensing both on the health and zoning uh, triggers which are different. Uh, are there any uh, burdens that fall on inspections because of um, other kinds uh, of the the housing side of the rentals, the Airbnbs, the uh, VRBO or home away kinds of things, uh, in the housing side of B and Bs. Yeah. Uh, so we respond to complaints. Uh, we respond to every complaint that's made, you know, an anonymous or a written complaint, called in, whatever it might be. And uh, there are a handful of complaints that end up being uh, an Airbnb. You know, whether or not it's actually a bed and breakfast. Serving breakfast is always the question we're trying to define it. Uh, but an Airbnb uh, location. Could be parking, could be just the a different type of activity that's occurring that has a, a butter asking uh, or inquiring about it. So we do respond to those. Uh, we have uh, in, in our, I guess, within staff, you know, my recommendation is that that's a good enough reason to consider licensing them in the future uh, in probably not a much different way than we do with the residential rental properties uh, now. Uh, in fact, there's a, a way to work that nicely into that bylaw, I think, for short-term rentals. Uh, uh, but of course, we're just beginning that conversation now. Yeah, the um, I was curious whether there are any costs that you've noticed associated that are not covered by fees and fines. No, I don't think there. I would be able to say that there's costs associated with it. Um, you know, it, there there are some number of them. There, it's not a large number that I would be able to associate with those types of, of uses, and unless we were to ever get into a, um, a mandatory inspection program, I don't think there would be any um, you know, recognizable cost. I'm mixing agenda items on our agenda a little bit, I know, but and I just want to recognize that uh, because you're here. Uh, because we are later going to have to talk about the uh, question as to whether a community impact fee is um, something that we would recommend is justified and recommended and so I was looking to see um, about the community impact question um, from your perspective generally in my last question that I was going to turn to my colleagues on the committee too um, um, have you done any just general um, revisiting of what we're charging now in our fees um, and uh, levying and fines to know whether um, they ought to be revised because uh, we're not entitled to use it as a profit enterprise, but on the other hand, we are entitled to um, levy fees to um, meet the costs of providing service. And has uh, have any of the fees been reevaluated recently? Uh, so we do look at the fees schedule uh, every year. We're preparing the budget. Uh, I didn't feel like there was a need to recommend uh, any increase. I think because of what our you know our overall um, receipts are for the department, I think it, it does become questionable where you know breaking down where um, additional fees would be. Um, uh, justified, so um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't make any rec recommendation in that area. I do have moving forward suggestions on um, ways that the by the rental bylaw specifically could see improvements, uh, and how to deal with repeat offenders and and make them you know a little bit more responsible for fees moving forward, and maybe the rest of the of uh, the applicants less responsible. And, and so a different type of structure, uh, but nothing that is on paper yet or uh, been presented. Mm -hmm. Good, Kathy. 
That's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask. Um, I've, I've heard re more than once from more than one area that we have often rental properties that there are um, potentially unsafe conditions, crowding conditions, violations, and otherwise. And I know you respond to complaints. So one of the questions was, was there a way of gradating the fee that you charge for rental to have there's the regular fee? And then if you do spot check inspections, so it's not just respond, and here's a place that just got a clean record for 10 or 20 years, they get what I call regular. And if it's many response problems, they get a warning or, you know, there's a red, green, blue light or something, and then they get a doubling of a fee, and then they get a tripling, you know, something that says make it a bit more painful, and at some point the license gets pulled. And what I'm hearing is that some people are afraid to complain because it's their, it's cheap where they're living, but they're living in pretty awful conditions, and they're not sure, they feel the, and this is a multiple unit couple places, that it's a place that they feel that they might lose their lease for the place, so it would be easier to know. And so I'll stop there, but just give my, from my own background, is that some states did this with nursing homes, where they had some, you know, periodic inspection, and then they only went after the uh, ones that were standing. It was a inspect by exception, you know, so not harass everyone, and they would say, let's go to the places that we know we've had problems with. So it conserved, and the fees paid for what might be extra inspection time. So it's thinking that way about uh, being kind to everyone who's running a great place, um, and then being tougher on where you have mounting evidence over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and these things were discussed, uh, you know, back in 2014 when we were creating the, the, the program. Uh, what's great now is we have several years now of data of, you know, what's happening out there uh, and, and where these uh, situations occur. So I think it, it is now appropriate to start to have those conversations, and I think we can look at uh, alternative types of structures like that, like you're mentioning, uh, now that we have this information. I will say that the, uh, the properties that raise concerns are very few in numbers when you look at the whole, the total of the properties. So it does present a challenge uh, as far as maintaining the, the revenue uh, for the program that we are collecting now because there just, there just aren't that many of those uh, those those properties that that have the repeat or the the and that's why I was thinking spot check and so you're not using a lot more people mm -hmm. and you're targeting them um, and that was what states had to do with nursing homes they said eighty percent we're not having a problem right. two percent we better go there more frequently right. so and we have that information now at least five years worth I will also mm -hmm. add that you know the program still is very new uh, yeah. but you can see in our uh, in our service levels. There's been a shift. So what started off in the early couple of years where most of the complaints and violations had to do with zoning-related items, mostly because we were doing drive-by uh, inspections of these various properties and dealing with things like cars on the lawn or signs, that type of activity. It's shifted significantly to the majority of the violations are now code-related, which is your health and sanitary and building and fire codes. And we are seeing a lot more, more and more every year, uh, calls from tenants, from uh, parents of tenants, from you know people who just know, you know friends, and, and it's a little bit different than it was early on, where we're not just responding to complaints from abutters to the properties that have the the issues. So I think we're we're getting we're moving in the right direction. Okay, go. Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions about that too. Um, many people have uh, complained that. Um, there are too many people in the apartments, um, and I know that you have uh, records that they say how many units or how many people they're supposed to have, but the complaints say there's too many cars out there, and they should go in and take a look and see why there's so many cars. Um, and often this is in areas where there's also too many cars parked on the streets that are, do not belong to the other homeowners. Um, so that is kind of like a, a spot inspection. You have the paper that said you're going to provide uh, four, four apartments or four people, 
and there's eight cars out there. Do you ever do that? Will you check it out? We do that all the time. Uh, and, you know, that trying to um, prove the number of occupants in a unit can be very time consuming and difficult sometimes. Um, although we do have many cases where uh, we have, with the participation of the property owner or landlord, that it, it gets resolved, uh, or at least temporarily gets resolved. And, and what you're describing by that drive-by site visit is exactly what we do and take note of what we see. And, and we'll do that multiple times over some period of time. And if we see consistency in the vehicles that are there and the lar in, 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 uh, excessive number of vehicles, then we go to the next step, and that might be asking for the lease. The bylaw allows us to require the lease from the, the landlord, and they're, they're required to, to provide it to us. So now we're, now we're seeing at least the, you know, the, the paperwork is in line for the right number of, of occupants. And then we start asking the landlord to do something, to, to you know, respond to this and ensure to us that the property is being uh, properly managed and that their tenants are being educated the way they need to be educated about the number of occupants. Now, we, as this goes on for a long period of time, we, in some cases, collect enough evidence where we're in a position where now we could, we could actually do something uh, if we needed to go in, in, and get some sort of a court order or do something uh, as far as our own local enforcement. 90% of the time, it's resolved before that. Uh, and then, uh, but sometimes, you know, we don't find enough evidence to really take the, the action any further. And then the other question that people have asked me is, um, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think you call it a three strikes rule, but if somebody doesn't live up to what they said or what the law is a certain number of times, something bad happens. Um, but if a landlord has registered, has many different addresses and many different entities, uh, each one of those entities can be a separate count. Do you ever pull it all together so you actually know who really owns what building? We generally know that with the, the cases that we're dealing with. Um, we do try to separate and look at the property and the issues that the property is having and not, uh, not uh, you know, look at the property in light of what, you know, we might have dealt with in a different situation. Uh, so they're not, for enforcement purposes or penalties, uh, they're not combined. Uh, but we are very much aware of um, the property owners that have multiple properties. Uh, we will use them as examples uh, w with each other, you know, with, um, with the property owner when we're dealing with an individual, uh, you know, as far as something that we might have dealt with on a, on a different, uh, different location. I, I just, I do want to complete by saying that people have noticed an improvement, okay, a very definite improvement, right. but there's still some stubborn cases here and there. Uh, anything else on um, inspections? Yeah, Jelani. <clears throat> what is the timeline for getting permits? I know you've mentioned there's a permitting program you're getting, which is with the hope of improving the efficiency of the permits. And, but what is the timeline, and are we competitive with other towns? The, I'm sorry, the timeline for getting permits getting and licenses. Permits. So we generally issue our perm we review and issue our permits within 10 days of uh, receipt. We under our building code regulation, we have 30 days to respond. Uh -huh. we're, we're much quicker than that. Okay. Uh, the majority of them are reviewed. You know, we have such great staff that a lot of most of the applications are um, are given to the building inspectors for review in a very complete way. Uh, so all the materials are there. A lot of the questions have already been answered. Uh, the applicants very well prepared. So those those applications get get. Um, uh, issued pretty quickly. In any case, we respond within that time frame, and sometimes the larger, more complicated projects will, will produce a, a, a list of questions or additional information that's needed, and then we wait for an architect or the contractor to respond to that. Okay. Just have a related, sort of related question. Uh, regarding the health and safety laws, how often are those reviewed? Because I can imagine there are new materials and that are available now and might be more cost effective for people, for businesses. So how often do we look at these laws? Uh, so health and safety laws are updated on some sort of schedule, depending on which ones we're talking about. For example, the building codes are usually every three years. Uh, fire regulations are every year. 
Health codes, I just, I mentioned earlier that there was uh, a new code this year. It's been a long time, it's been 20 plus years. I don't even know exactly how, it's been a long time since that was seriously looked at. Uh, but generally most of our, our codes in, that we deal with are regularly updated. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay. Um, I just, just I think you probably know this, um, but building on Shalini's question, there's a perception that we are slower to let a new business open up. You know, it just is harder. And a business that has the equivalent thing on a Route 9 in Hadley and is now opening it up on our part of it. So, um, and it's never been clear how to bring those to someone's attention because sometimes the people that are concerned don't want to say anything because they would like it just to go through, you know, so they're in the midst of it. So, so how is there a way of, you know, getting a general sense of either the IT part of it, of streamlining it, of coordinating teams so that it's not team member one, then two, then three? So, because yeah. there is that perception. So, right, and I, and I think, and what I was responding to, I think is very different. So that's, that's very um, specific to a building permit application, what I was, you know, what I was mentioning in the timeframes. What you're talking about is includes a land use permit, most likely. Could be a zoning board of appeals. Right, and they're opening up a new restaurant, or right. they, they've so, got a restaurant so, they bought and they want to continue doing something, and they have to go back and get the permits for each piece of it, or or an auto supply store. You know, just right. name. And it's this is more coming from the business businessy side of things. Although residents will also tell you. Um, I'd rather not expand the front of my house because someone will know about it. I can do a porch and back and then just do it. You know, I mean, right. it's a similar thing, like it takes too long. So we have, I mean, we have a process and staff to be really proud of in this area. So we have what, you know, it's called the permit administrator. We created this position uh, several years ago. And that's the first point of contact for somebody. Unfortunately, somebody that comes into the office sometimes has no idea the scope of what is needed for the various licenses and approvals. And most of those have some sort of a timeline associated that's dictated by state law, not by anything locally here. And to help them get prepared and go through that process and be successful with it does take time. Uh, what's great is that we have staff here that is always willing to meet with that person, no matter how many times it's needed, and help them and guide them through that process. But you're absolutely right. There's lengthy process depending on what type of uh, business is, is being uh, looked at uh, for opening, it could be it could be lengthy. Uh, some of them as many as 90 days. Mm -hmm. This really does relate to our later agenda item, but it also relates to the existing rental policies, and that is talk about the extent to which the police, DPW, and inspections work together when the ongoing violations are uh, identified. Uh, we have now for, I've been here seven years, we, when I came here we started what we call the joint inspections team. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only are our inspectors out there in the field together, uh, say we're looking at a fraternity uh, inspection that we do twice a year. That's done jointly with the fire department, a health inspector, and a building inspector. Uh, we do that in all of our projects. Uh, DPW, I, you know, we're in uh, constant communication because of uh, uh, driveway permits and parking lot resurfacing. Uh, we work with the police department. We often attend roll call, and we'll talk about some of the things to look out for when we're not here at night and, and they're working and where we can be helpful, and they do the same. So there, there's a great, great amount of communication between the various departments with inspection services. Thank you. If I could just add something to the earlier response about complaints or concerns about our process. Um, I know that I've had a number of conversations recently with, with, with Paul and also Jeff Kravitz, our economic development director. Um, so I think the bottom line is we've gotten better. We can always improve. Any city or town can, can improve their process. And we want to be open to feedback from the community, from the bid, from the chamber, from individuals, uh, without that fear that uh, there, you know, there, there might be a compromise permit in the future or something like that. So we're looking at that. We're talking about that internally. How can we gather that input and uh, apply it to some of the things we're doing? Rob spoke about uh, um, updating our software. Clearly, that would be a, 
a, uh, a major improvement for our process. If, if uh, Dave Zomek can fill out a, a, a roofing permit at home and send in his application and pay his fee, get it reviewed by an inspector and have that uh, without having to come into town hall, uh, that saves Dave Zomek or applicant A, B, C, D from, from uh, time and energy they might spend here. So we're open to that. We're open to uh, looking at how our process uh, may be improved. So I think that's certainly something we're going to look at in 19 and 20 and beyond. Anything else? Well, thank you. Then we can uh, get to conservation. Sure, I'll be very brief. I'm conscious of, of the time and the time you, you all have spent here today reviewing these departments. Um, so I, I sit in this unique position as Assistant Town Manager and, and Director of Conservation and Development. It, it gives me the opportunity to work with wonderful folks like Rob and Christine and, and staff in planning and inspections and conservation. Um, uh, it also affords me the opportunity to uh, work uh, at the direction of the Town Manager on special projects throughout town. Um, but I also directly oversee um, conservation department, which is seated within uh, this functional area. As I said earlier, I think uh, we've we've done tremendous work to try to to bring these these departments together. Communication, collaboration, information sharing helps us serve residents, developers, uh, new restaurants, all the people we serve, our taxpayers, uh, much better by having these departments. Uh, all in one. An inspector can walk across the room and talk to our wetlands administrator who can walk across, you know, 10 feet over and talk to a, an inspector who can talk to a, a, a senior planner about a project that's coming before a board or committee. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense. We're improving it every day. In conservation, the main areas that we focus on are sustainability, wetlands permitting, and land management. I won't go into a lot of detail. You've heard a lot of presentations from us and other folks uh, Happy to take your questions at the end. But I think for FY20, uh, we'll be focused on a number of different areas within those main categories. Under sustainability, uh, we know that uh, the ECAC has kicked off. Clearly, that is going to be a major focus point for the remainder of this year and, and well into the years ahead, looking at how we can reduce our carbon footprint and achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, Stephanie Ciccarello will continue to work to get uh, green communities grants. The, this is state funding that we can bring into our town to help with building assessments, to help with building upgrades. Um, we are working very hard behind the scenes on our solar project at the uh, North Landfill. Um, Stephanie and I have been uh, in the trenches, shall we say, on that for a number of years. It is alive, it is well, and we believe we will be bringing that project to the town uh, in the coming months. So. Um, don't give up on that landfill solar. It is, it is coming. Um, uh, maintenance and enhancement of town conservation assets. So our, my staff out in the field work both on conservation land, which includes all of our 80 miles of trails, as well as our watershed lands uh, up in Shutesbury, uh, Pelham, uh, parts of Belchertown, and parts of Amherst. So that is over 5,000 acres of land uh, that that staff manages. They manage it for timber harvesting, they manage it for uh, rare and endangered species, for the ecology of the area, and of course they manage it for people. Um, I couldn't do a, a talk about next year without just touching on Puffer's Pond and some of the changes we're proposing up on State Street. Um, I've been working very closely with Guilford Mooring, our superintendent of public works, and his staff on some really much needed changes up on State Street to make it safer. Uh, make it more sustainable, make it easier for people to access the pond in a more reasonable way. So you'll see those happening in the coming weeks and months. Um, we'll be working a lot on trails and parking uh, and making our, our trails more accessible to people. We'll be improving our bridges. Uh, all of this, of course, is, is uh, predicated on, on having funds to do that. We submitted recently a very large grant with the Kestrel Trust, who is a wonderful partner out there in the community to uh, improve the Robert Frost Trail, which uh, is our major trail uh, used by both uh, residents and through, through hikers. Um, and we really hope that that grant is gonna bring much needed maintenance money for bridges and, and the trail within Amherst to us. It will also pay, if we get the grant, for additional staff time. So we're not just depending on the money we get from the town, we're also always looking for grants 
and other ways to supplement our budgets. And then finally, um, we do have some pending acquisitions that I know you know about uh, through the CPA dollars. Three very exciting potential acquisitions. I would just highlight the Hickory Ridge uh, golf course as, as probably the, the, the prize in all of that. They're all spectacular, but that one clearly stands out. Um, if that moves through the process and we acquire that, it's a very uh, exciting opportunity for the community to bring uh, connectivity to many residents of East Adley Road that currently do not have access to green space and uh, walking trails, hiking trails, and picnic areas, et cetera. Um, finally, just uh, in terms of our FY20 uh, budget, I'm grateful to the town manager and, and finance staff um, for some modest increases both in operating and capital. Uh, on the operating side, that will allow us uh, some modest increases uh, in summer staff. Uh, we can't do it all alone. I have 1.75 FTEs in the field. So that's one, one, one and three quarter people to manage five, roughly 5,000 acres of land and 80 miles of trails. So in the summer, we hire uh, high school students and college students to help us with that work. So uh, there's a modest increase there. And then on the capital side, I, I presented to JCPC some weeks back and talked about um, fixing some of the bridges. We have very significant bridges. You wouldn't think so, but we've got some doozies. And they're big bridges, and we're not talking hundreds of dollars to fix them, repair them. Some of them have been washed out by recent storms. Uh, and a bridge might cost, believe it or not, $20,000, $25,000 to replace. So some modest increases there. So um, I think I'll stop there um, and take your questions. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start with the general question or comment and then turn it into a question. The comment is that on page 85, um, where you list, um, were, were listed as uh, some of the um, accomplishments and objectives at the top of the page and then service levels at the bottom. Some of the things that have to do with um, new initiatives um, that are climate related or sustainability related um, are not reflected in the service level end of the report. And um, for future years, I just um, so just giving it some thought, the one that sort of tripped my head immediately was bike share. That, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was curious as to know whether how the bike share went the first years, the numbers, um, and um, certainly would like to be even more interested next year as to whether we have more bike share participation in the second year of operation unless we um, get that information to us. So that was one, uh, a, a general comment. Uh, the other thing, um, getting back to bike share, um, and I'll also ask it in relation to the dog park, which is another one you could put statistics in maybe if you can count the number of dogs that uh, do whatever, um, is that um, um, whether they're staffing or budget consequences to the bike share programs or the uh, dog park that's coming online hopefully soon that we should be uh, cognizant of in the budget process. Um, well, I'll start with bike share. I think the reality is that, you know, the town has devoted a significant amount of um, staff time to bike share, both really in three, three departments. One would be conservation, another would be planning, and the third would be DPW. So um, at, at the very least, we have, we have dedicated staff time to helping to bring the grant money to the communities that participated in, in bike share, and then to physically get the program to be situated in Amherst. So Stephanie, Christine, and Guilford Mooring staff, um, and, and I'm sure Tina, um, Shen, in, elect, in uh, the uh, Inspection Services Department also, you know, so around the edges, there's a number of staff who have touched that that program and brought that to them, uh, to us and the other communities. Um, we've tried where we can to uh, not take on the capital costs of that program. So the grant paid for some of those costs. We've had some modest costs related to the installation of the bikes here units uh, and the, the physical infrastructure. Um, I certainly uh, have asked Stephanie about some of the data, some of the early responses we got, and Chris may know better than I, but. 
Um, we, let's put it this way, we hope for better data in year two than I think in year one because it was a little hard to tease out the Amherst data. There's, there's data for all the communities, but it was a little hard to get the Amherst specific data on usage. So we'll certainly mm -hmm. press for that in the future. Um, your second question was related uh, to- Dog park. Dog park. Um, so our goal um, is to be under construction with the dog park uh, in the fall of this year. Uh, so we would not see any usage of, uh, at the dog park until probably late spring or early summer of 2020. So I don't anticipate there being much uh, direct staff cost other than time for planning this year. All of the construction costs, all of the building costs, for the most part will be absorbed by the grant uh, and CPA dollars. Uh, certainly, many departments will contribute to that, including planning, uh, my time, as well as some time from DPW, but we're trying to minimize that and, and offload most of that and pay for it with the grants from the Stanton Foundation. In the long run, there will be some uh, cost to that. Um, certainly, Carol Hepburn's position as animal welfare officer will have a role in helping to manage um, some of the week to week or month to month um, um, uh, activities there. Uh, there is going to be a very active friends group coming out of the dog park task force and Jim Pistrang and others really hope that that friends group will do a couple of things. One is that they will be kind of an on the ground um, eye every day, every week, every month there, helping with um, cleanup, with enforcement of rules and regulations and also fundraising. So we'll be putting together a budget. We don't have a budget for that. Uh, probably until FY21, which would be kind of the first full year of operation. The park itself will sit for a number of months. Really, it will watch the grass grow because you can't let dogs and people on there right as that new grass is planted and growing. You really need to try to leave it for perhaps the fall and spring of 20 before you let people on there or all that grass will be uh, having grown for naught. So. Um, so we will look at some of the costs uh, in FY21 and beyond. Yeah, and I'll close it just by saying, with, it's my understanding, and only speak if I'm wrong, that uh, some communities have a system of charging fee for use of dog park that's not anticipated by our dog park committee. We, they did look at that, but the strong feeling was that this should be open without a fee to all, at least initially, and, and I think do some assessment after some years. The Stanton Foundation does, in terms of the capital cost, the Stanton Foundation does allow for subsequent grants. If they, if they fund the design, the construction, they then allow you to apply in subsequent years for improvements or maintenance money for the park. So I've already talked to the Stanton Foundation reps and they're I'm more than open for us coming back in future years if we need an enhancement or if something doesn't work or breaks or whatnot. So. Kathy, you had your hand up. I yeah, I have two questions that are quite different from each other, so I don't know whether I should ask one and give someone else time to ask another and come back, but um, my first is uh, related to uh, your how you make a strategic decision or the, with the town manager on a I want to dredge Puffer Pond. I need uh, some expensive trail maintenance where I'm not going to get a grant for it. So I could go to CPA for some of this because it fits. I also want to purchase more land for conservation. So watching where the requests have come in and as we're ever tighter on the JCPC side of capital, it occurred to me when I saw CPA there are a lot of opportunities for drawing on CPA funds to maintain conservation land or recreational areas that we always have. So that kind of balancing out which source of funding, if you haven't identified another source, like you said, Robert Frost might have another source, which clearly would be great. So that's my first question. My second is, uh, can I, can I yeah, answer that I, one I'll come back, I'll come back to it maybe and let everyone come around. Um, so I think I would start by saying um, we all know that land is finite, so there's only so much land in the town of Amherst. Um, we have really tried in recent years 
since I've been here to simply prioritize. There, there was a time when Amherst, I think, was actually, believe it or not, buying a lot more land than we are now for conservation purposes. That was during the 70s and 80s when uh, I think people were very afraid of subdivisions and sprawl and, and um, the town changing too much in, in one direction. Um, so now we, we really stick to our open space and recreation plan. So we've talked about this before. Under the master plan is the open space and recreation plan. And I, I would um, um, encourage anyone to look at that plan, look at those maps, and see, you can see very clearly that any acquisition that we propose is, is clearly identified as a priority area under the open space and recreation plan. I think our program is winding down, frankly. And I think within the next three or four years, we will be seeing a shift from acquisition requests to management requests. And this is just, it's a natural progression in any town or any organization that stops acquiring land, but then needs to maintain it. And I wanna be crystal clear, and I've said this many times, but it, it's really important. Most of the money we need to spend on our land has to do with people. So if we acquire 100 acres and we don't create any trails and we allow informal access, that land really doesn't cost that much at all in direct costs. But something like Puffer's Pond, something that has trails, something that adds a recreational component, then all of a sudden you're talking maintenance, you're talking bridges, you're talking tree limbs, you're talking tree removal when a big storm goes through and we have 100 trees fall over trails, that takes a lot of time, energy, and money. So I think you'll see something like this, our land acquisition going down, but our requests for maintenance will go up. They won't go up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it's just a natural progression in, in town that um, you know, We've, we've acquired what we want. We value those lands. We think they're important in the mosaic of, of town land and town uh, amenities, um, but we don't need to acquire any, any more. And frankly, we need to up our game in terms of maintenance. So I think you will see more requests. If I'm here, you will see more requests to CPAC and likely JCPC to maintain those lands. I will say our history in Amherst, um, um, on CPAC funding, um, and Sonia might be able to help me out, but it's only fairly recently that towns and cities have been able to use CPAC money to maintain conservation land. Is it a couple of years, perhaps, Sonia? Prior to that, it was not an allowable use under CPA uh, law. So now that it is, um, I think our request this year was for forty or fifty thousand dollars. It got reduced to ten. I'll be back next year to ask for more money. Um, and I think that will become one of the stable sources of fundings to maintain our land. If we want to do significant improvements at, say, Puffer's Pond, uh, other places, um, we'll have to look at multiple sources, grants, um, capital money, and perhaps CPAC. The, one limita the, the huge limiting factor on CPAC funds is you can only use it on land that was purchased with CPA dollars. So that's a really important distinction. Mm -hmm. So something like Puffer's Pond was, was acquired by gift or purchase without CPA funds. So we actually can't use CPA dollars for the most part. There, there may be some creative options there, but for the most part, we can't improve land that wasn't purchased with CPA dollars. So, um, so anyway, in terms of dredging, dredging is on our list. And I'll be working with Paul and others. Um, we are doing some of the pre-dredging pre work. We're looking at the depth of sediment in Puffer's Pond, and we're beginning to formulate a plan on, uh, for dredging. Um, if you get out there this year, you'll see that given the winter we had and the water levels we had, the sediment levels have changed pretty dramatically out there. It's quite interesting to see what a dynamic system it is out there. But, um, yeah, there'll be a lot of areas for wading for children this year, given all the new sediment that came down the Cushman Brook. So, I hope that answers that question. Shelley? Could we get an estimate of how much land is uh, conserved right now? And my other thing was, can we utilize residents for trail maintenance? And seeing that that was such a success, what we did with the cleanup, so could we involve residents for trails maintenance as well? 
Yes, so we know exactly how many acres we own in Amherst. It's all in the open space plan. It's all online. So we own, I d the number is just, just over 2,000 acres of land um, in town. What percentage and then, and then we also have worked with farmers to preserve um, their land, uh, many, many acres of farmland. That's still privately held. So it's active agriculture. We don't have any uh, rights to, to uh, walk or hike or do anything on that land other than the development rights have been sold. Um, so in terms of volunteer efforts, we do volunteer efforts all year long. Um, I think we need to do more. Um, the Friends of Puffer's Pond is a wonderful group. They have been raising money out at Puffer's Pond for 27 years. And every year they donate between three and $6,000 to the maintenance of Puffer's Pond. Um, they're gonna take a little, a little break this year. They're not gonna have the pancake breakfast this year, but they're gonna try to raise some money anyway. So you'll see more coming out on that. But yes, we do need to engage more volunteers. We have a number of friends groups and they kind of adopt an area like adopt Mount Pollux, adopt um, a Larch Hill conservation area. So let's move along because we do want to spend a few minutes on the other issue. Okay, I was just going to build on volunteers this week, and I heard you have volunteers who would help you do trail maintenance in an active way, and Central Park does trail maintenance, so does Appalachia. You have trash. A group suggested you could have some trash warriors. We, mm. The amount of trash we found around puffers was amazing, but there's a group willing just to do it in an, a very organized, ongoing way. So I'll send you some of the ideas that people came great. up with. with there were volunteers in the room. It wasn't purely hypothetical. Super. <laughs> That'd be great. So anything else that you had, Kathy? I was always so want to move on to. But that was the big one because I thought you've got okay. willing outdoors people who would love to help maintain some of these lands and trails. Yes, and uh, I mean, without being cliche, they're the future of maintaining these lands, and they are. Uh, uh, a public asset. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate the presentation today, all three, and appreciate what you do for us every day. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you. Andy, yes. I need a break. Okay. Uh, so, you want a couple minute break? Yes. Um, but I just wanted to give my opinion for this to you. The enthusiasm for the That's great. That's private. If you don't want to do this whole presentation, we just go to the last page, basically, and what your options are. That's what I want us to do that. Vote for maximum income. Vote for maximum income. It's my option. Yeah. I'm leaving. Okay. But, no, but I read this research paper on the economic costs and benefits of Airbnb, and I can send that to you all, but it might be too late, but just based on this, my opinion was to charge, because it's benefiting more, it's a benefit, the Airbnb benefits the richer people, and it adds more burden to the town and the poorer re renters. So it's fair to charge the three percent or whatever. So that was the argument I had. So I'm just telling you where I am standing on this critical vote. I'm going to make a note right now that uh, Shalini is having to leave because she's teaching a class. Um, she is going to submit um, something to us for consideration, which because of open meeting laws, 
needs to be recognized in the minutes and um, needs to be included in the packet. And it was a uh, study on the um, economic consequences of Airbnb rentals on communities. I can just sh summarize my perspective based on that, which I'll be sharing, is that it looks at who is it benefiting and who is it, who, uh, what are the costs. So it, it, the Airbnb does benefit uh, upper richer people at the cost of the town and renters. So it recommended charging the fee so that, yeah, to offset that. So that's where I stand on this. So. Uh I appreciate your finding that, and uh, we'll make sure that it gets appended into the, into the minutes so that uh, we take care of that. Paul. Thank you. Um, so we're not going to do this full presentation. You have it in front of you. We'll be uploading it as well. Um, in sum, the state passed a law in December that allows uh, the town to collect uh, taxes on Airbnb-type uh, short-term rentals. Um, much like we collect, already collect taxes on uh, hotels and motels. So I'm actually going to, so it applies to short-term rentals. I'm going to race through this. If you have questions, you've got it in front of you, you can ask me them. Sure. Um, the uh, state room occupancy tax is 5.7%. The tax is paid directly to the Department of Revenue. And this will require Airbnb operators um, who, who have rent more than 14 days a year to register with the Department of Revenue. Um, this is a definition of what, how they define short-term rental, which I won't go into. There are several options available to the council. This one we already do. We've accepted the room occupancy tax. This change in law automatically applies to Airbnb, so we don't have to do anything on this. The date is important in that if you want this to go into effect on July 1, you have to, the council will need to adopt it by May 31st. If you don't, and we move it into, if we do it later in June or July, then it will go into effect on October 1. Um, if we've already accepted it, which is, like I just said, we, it automatically goes in, so there's no action required by the council um, for the regular room occupancy. Um, this is, um, doesn't really apply to us. The, the, the item for you to consider today is if you want to do option two, which is the local option community impact fee. This is up to 3% of the rent for transfers of occupancies for certain types of short-term rentals. Uh, there are two different types that we'll go through. The first, and, but it requires a separate vote for each one. Um, and again, it, it, depending on when you adopt this, it's when it will be tick, become effective. Um, it says only available if a city town has accepted local option excise under 64G3A. We have already done that. Um, so the first option for you um, is a local option community impact fee, which applies to um, professionally managed units, one or two or more short-term rental units in the same town, not located within a single or two or three family dwelling. So those are things that are in larger buildings. The second option is if you say, no, we do want to um, apply those to two or three family dwellings. That includes the operator's primary residence. So you can do, these are um, supplemental, and Jeff can help me if I get this wrong. Um, and so you can do one, and then you can do two as well. Um, the way this works is they changed the law since December. They, um, the Department of Revenue will collect the fee and then distribute it. When the m money comes into the town, 35% must be de dedicated to affordable housing or local infrastructure projects. You can do more, but you can't do less than 35%. And this comes straight into the, uh, there's some rules about how the comptroller will have to handle this, uh, these funds when they get reported to, to the town. Um, the third option, I'm not recommending you do anything with now. This is to accept, to adopt uh, ordinances or bylaws or regulations to, to regulate these. I don't think we're in a position to do that at this moment, but I think, you know, as we have talked about with the building commissioner, these are some things that we're going to want to be reviewing in the relatively near future. So um, this is the last slide that you need to look at. These are proposed motions. And um, 
the first one applies at a rate. It, it, it puts, sets the rate at 3%, which is the maximum, and it applies to uh, one of two or more short-term rental units in the same town. The second one is, again, the 3%, and this is for the, for the smaller buildings that would, this would apply to. And the third motion would be to say that we will dedicate 35% of the community impact fee to affordable housing or local infrastructure projects. Um, someone may ask, well, why would you do it for smaller units? And I think we feel like um, it, it that the impact of an Airbnb is, has the same impact whether it's, it doesn't matter who the ownership is, uh, is or how big the building is. If there is a single family house or two family house that has a unit that's used for Airbnb um, type structures, that there is an impact on the neighborhood with additional cars coming and going, uh, additional concerns by the neighborhood that might uh, wind up in a police call, which happens fairly frequently. Some people say, I see an unusual car going in and out of this house. Well, it turns out that it's a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. So there are things that impact the town, no matter what the size of the unit is. Jeff, did I get that? Yeah, just one clarification. The 35% is only 35% of the additional 3%. It's not on the 6% that's automatically included. So um, I've done a fair amount of reading about this in the last uh, day or so to get prepared, including looking at the statute. Um, and this is labeled as a community impact fee because it's to recognize that um, these uh, rental establishments have an effect on the community have an impact on the community, the costs, the communities are bearing costs, which is what Shalini was referring to when she was uh, looking at her paper. The one thing that I found confusing about what I was looking at, and I don't know if you have an answer to this, Jeff, is that um, they define professionally managed units as one of two or more short-term rental units in the same city or town operated by the same operator and not located in a single or two, three family dwelling that includes the operator's residence. So if one person owns just one house that they rent out through Airbnb that's not also their residence, that seems to escape both sections which I found to be yes, an oversight to by the great and general court. And, uh, but it didn't make sense to me. So Andy, you're reading that and it has to be both things. They've, they've got two or more and one of them they live in. And then the second one would apply only if they live in it. So we've missed the place where, is that the way you're reading it? I think yeah. that seems to be the only way to read that. And, uh, I was trying to see if you had any other thought on that or if that's the way you interpret it. Is that it's just a, a gap that was, may have been unintended and we may want to bring that to the attention of our senator and representative if um, indeed that is what the circumstance is, but it's not a reason not to go forward. The other thing that's obvious is, is that um, you can adopt the first and then choose to adopt the second, you can't adopt the second without having adopted the first. But that's, that's the way I would read it, that if you adopted both, um, you could separate. So if one person owns one that they live in and another they don't live in, the first one applies to the one they don't live and the second one applies to the one they do live in. That's the way I would, would say you've covered of instance where three, four, or five properties, any property they're not living in is the first, and any property they're living in is, is the second. I think I could read it that way. Now, I, I, I read the, the, the second, uh, the short-term rentals located in two or three family dwellings that include the operator's primary residence is similar to a neighbor um, of mine who owns a house with an apartment in the house that um, the neighbor rents out through Airbnb um, when the opportunity arises, but that is also um, her principal residence. 
And that's where you're either choosing to include or not include. Uh, is where, is that your understanding, Jeff? Yes, that's my understanding as well, that um, basically it's saying the first step is we want the 3% excluded from charging the 3% are single two or three families where the owner lives in, in the building. And then the second step is if we don't want that situation, we, um, the town council would adopt the second provision, which would allow uh, collection of that 3% on two or three families where the owner has their principal residence. Okay, Paul. So, so I think one thing to take into consideration is that this uh, state law has a giant impact on Cape Cod. And that's where most of the energy for this bylaw came. And it might be that they're exempting people who own res um, vacation homes there by doing this. That's the only thing I can think of for that exclusion. It just makes no sense. Yeah. Um, but it is something to investigate. And then the, the last, the other question I have looking at uh, the draft motions that are up there. Um, is the third motion uh, required that we do now? No. And um, because we may want to have more than 35% of the fee going into uh, local infrastructure roads, which are used by people who rent. Yeah. So the, you don't need to do, take act, any action on that. It will, it will automatically go in, into that, the categories as 35%. And once it's in, the other 65% um, will go to, for general use. So you can use that however you want. It gives you the maximum flexibility for the use of the revenue. That's why I would keep whatever it is at 35%. You could do nothing and, and, and it will happen automatically. Or you can say, I don't want any more than 35% to go into that. Um, but you still have the other 65% coming in for general purposes. And the other note that Jeff pointed out is that these are not actual motions. These would be recommended, recommend, recommendations from the Finance Committee to the full council. Um, in, a, in the same vein, the uh, question of uh, whether the 35% or more um, goes to um, infrastructure goes to affordable housing is not a decision that needs to be made at the time of adoption. Um, I think this wording in the third implies only 35%. So if we don't say anything, we could go higher, we can't go lower, correct? You know, so by not making the third motion, you know, if someone wanted to push hard for 50% of this to go into this, but it leaves both the option once it's 35%, I'm, I'm asking as a question, 35% gets set aside, all of that could go into infrastructure rather than affordable housing, all of it could go, it's, it's optional, you know, rather than required. It's just 35% gets set aside. But this I think caps it at 35% if we do it, I, I think, you know, otherwise, because if we're silent, it's always at least 35. Yeah. So, so the reason I, I'm always looking for maximal flex, maximum flexibility for any revenue source so that the council, the town can do whatever it wants with it. I think you will see a push for someone to say, um, if I were in a different seat, I'd say, let's make 70% go to affordable housing, period. And I try to drive away from dedicated sources of revenue so the town can, the full, the town can make informed decisions on what the needs of the town are. So, um, so I want to make sure. So in other words, this law does not affect single homes that are done for Airbnb or our ability to tax those do not, are not affected. So it depends on how the council votes. If the council accepts the first, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, yes, single family homes, um, if they own one in, same owner only owns one single family home in a town, they would not be subject to this, that's my understanding. Second question, 
Uh, is there any revenue sharing with the 6% the state already collects? Except how it might come back to us from general funds. The, the revenue from uh, the rental tax would come go to, right into the general fund that they, they the, collect for us. The state collects 6%. We're entitled to the 3 do we get any, what benefit do we get from the 6%? So the 6% the is the same as the hotel tax right. and it comes in from DOR to our general fund. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's part we, of our We general get a portion fund. of hotel and motel tax that goes directly into the general fund. But the 3, the 35% only applies to our 3%. Yes. And I'm going to just be very clear. I totally agree with the town manager in keeping it at 35 and remaining, keeping the rest as flexible as possible. So I, I think that, um, yeah, Dorothy. Uh, I just wanted to say that I support the second motion uh, for two and three family dwellings, even if it's the operator's primary residence, because I could just see that misused terribly um, three family party house, you have no idea how many people, I mean, a lot of Airbnb, people just are doing couch surfing, they're not even getting a room, um, no sh and they share bathrooms. Um, I think we've got to include that even if, if somebody is listed as an owner operator in the premises, it has got to be covered. Which is to then to support both the first and the second motion. And, and I think this is being, well, at least as written up there, it's a package right now of three motions, and uh, I'm in support of what Lynn said, that I think the third piece is important, and I always assume the first two went together. We need both. Otherwise, there's a loophole in it. Right. Yeah, no, uh, we need to make clear that the council needs to make, as far as the accepting the local option, um, potentially two motions, which it seems that the consensus is running to suggest two motions that um, we recommend. And then the question of the third motion is a separate issue, but a valid question too, as to whether to put that before the council now. Um, Do you want to move them? Do you want to move them individually or together? The first two? I think you, we, we need the council to take two separate votes okay. so that um, however you word it, as far as a motion from this committee, it needs to be clear that you're recommending two votes from the council. I move that we recommend to the council the, that they accept both the first and second motion as presented at this meeting to us. Your second? There's motion made and seconded. Um, any further discussion? Okay, the wording, when she said, we talked about having two motions, but one motion would be one and two, and the second motion would be three. I don't think that was clear enough. No, the, the, I, we're moving that the town vote one and two. We're but voting to move to... Um, the third one we haven't moved at all on. Okay. To move on that. the professionally managed units as defined in the statute and short-term rentals located in two or three family dwellings that include the operator's primary residence. Okay. And, uh, and then that's clarified. So we are recommending those two, the council act on both of those required motions required under 64G3D, which is the new statutory section. So, discussion any further? All in favor indicate by raising hands. Four to zero, one member absent. Um, going on. I'm gonna move that we recommend to the council the third motion, which is that 35% of the community impact fee are collected under the Mass General Law Chapter. 64G section 3D be dedicated to affordable housing or local infrastructure projects and the balance of the funds be a general fund revenue of the town of Amherst that may be appropriated for any municipal purpose. 
I second the motion. Any discussion? So I do have one other thing to say after we vote, but I support the motion, so I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor, indicate by raising hands. Four to nothing, one member absent. Um, the comment on that last motion is that we could, if we chose, make a further motion right now that um, is to whether the 35% uh, should go into local infrastructure recognizing the needs of our roads or uh, whether we want to leave it for future council in committee action. Hearing I, none. I, yes. want, I want to leave it as flexible as possible. I would just note that any funds that are in that account um, would be subject to appropriation, so the council would have to say, uh, say there's 10 million in the account, we want to spend all 10 million on local infrastructure. It couldn't. I like your just, numbers. So. Yeah, I like your numbers too. No, actually it's a good point though that it does need to come back to the council for future votes, so it has to come back to this committee so that we can reserve our discussion on this for a future day with more notice. We did hear one presentation at the council meeting arguing one, one position on the use of funds, but we don't have to touch that. So I think that we're done. And just for the minute's sake, um, we didn't read them aloud. We looked at them. So could you send me this presentation? Then I can just refer to it, okay. you know, in, in terms of my minutes. Because uh, I can also, if you send it, I can copy and paste exactly what's written here. Otherwise, it says we move to accept the first and second motion. So I don't want to write them out. Thank you. Okay. So um, any budget updates at this point? I don't see any recognition. There's obviously no comment, public to comment. Um, we're not needing to act on minutes at this time, so we can do a motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. And we are, um, everybody agrees we're adjourned by consensus at 4.50. It's been a long day and I thank you all very much.